Wow, you can't hear me. Sorry about that. Guys, we are live. This is the SureDog Recap Show, live on the SureDog YouTube page. Uh, we are recapping UFC Vegas 31, UFC Makachev versus Moises. I'm your host. I'm a writer for SureDog.com. I am Keith Schillen. Joining me as always is the senior editor of SureDog.com, Mr. Ben Duffy. Ben, how you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. You know, uh, as we kind of said uh, middle of the week while we were uh, previewing this card, just another card, but with a few interesting things on it, and we saw a few interesting things tonight. So that much at least played out like we expected. Yeah, so we said that this was like the hangover. You know, you you, you, know, you go out, you have a big bang. That was last week's card, you know, poor A. McGregor 3. This is the hangover card. I think we're at the part now where we're going to talk about this. Where you didn't you didn't, didn't necessarily go home with a fat chick, but maybe you, you know a lot of times when you go out drinking, you decide to stay out too late. Maybe you had an after party after the after the party. You go hit up the pancake house. You know we we have at Bickford's where we are. I don't know I don't know what you know the local pancake house is where you're at the twenty four hour pancake house. What do you, what do you got? Oh, th- this is the South, man. We got Waffle House. Waffle That's House, okay. Yep. So you go to Bucky's though. There's. The thing about Bucky's is, uh, for those who don't know, Keith discovered Bucky's a month or two ago, and he understands why Texas is awesome now. Yeah, but the absolutely. thing you need to know about Bucky's is that it is between civilization. Like, I would literally have to drive probably like forty miles to get to a Bucky's. <laughs> oh, that's that's not further enough away. That's, I mean, Bucky's is well worth it. Get, get a get a you know uh, pulled pork sandwich at like three a.m. at Bucky's. So that's what this is. This is the pulled pork sandwich uh, recap. Is as we just had 10 fights, one fight was canceled. Uh, the Anderson Dos Santos versus Miles Johns fight was canceled due to someone in Anderson Dos Santos's camp coming down with COVID or tested positive with COVID. Some kind of, some kind of COVID thing at this point. Uh, but then we had 10 fights. I didn't I didn't do well at all on my picks. I went 5-5. Five and five. Uh, I went with a couple underdogs. Uh, none of the underdogs came through for me. Uh, how did you do? I went 7-3. and three. Okay, seven and three. Um, so, so you had a better night than me. Well, I'll I'll say this: I'm not usually that proud of my picks, but I went seven and three. All of us got the Figueredo versus Gordon fight wrong. So the best anyone did was nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. So you know, I got seven, and that included me taking a pretty serious flyer on uh, Stolzfus over Vieta. So I don't feel too bad about yeah, it. Yeah, pretty good night for you. I'm uh, I'm dead last in the Pick'em League for a reason. I, I I can live with it. Yeah. So one of the one of the big favorites on the entire card was Islam Makhachev. He was making his UFC main event debut. He took on another fighter that was making his UFC main event debut, Thiago Moises. It was it was it was uh, booked as you know grappler versus grappler, a, a wrestler or a sambo fighter versus a jiu-jitsu guy, and that's kind of what we had going on in this one. Islam Makhachev. Um, only has one loss in his career been uh not only has he been perfect other than that one fight he he's been perfect in most of the fights too besides mm-hmm. the overall record and, and that's what we kind of had tonight there was he you know he wasn't way ahead on the scorecards uh in the sense that he was dominating this wasn't tenny habib kind of rounds but you know he blanked him through three rounds then took him out in the fourth round it was that it was that team that gets up by like 14 points early in the fight and then just kind of runs it out you know like it was close but there was no no contesting who was ahead kind of thing that's what i felt like about this uh islam was uh, is a much better fighter than jagger moises at this point in their careers at this point in their careers he is absolutely a much better fighter and i'm gonna lean on it being a little more of a blowout i think than, okay. than you seem to think i mean none of the individual rounds was a blowout like there was no I, I wouldn't have scored any of those anywhere near a 10-8 round but the cumulative effect of each one like sure. uh moises looked more discouraged at the end of each successive round sure. uh just his moments of offense like any sort of hope were fewer and further between because uh, you know you'll probably talk a little more about the x's and nose he landed some pretty good strikes in the first round like the i yeah. don't think he outstruck Makachev, but he had his moments like, you know, he landed a head kick that was just barely blocked. He he, he got in his licks in the first round. Uh, I believe it was the second round when he took uh, Makachev's back. And Very Makachev briefly. just 
promptly, but yeah, just promptly got reversed. Makachev landed, I think he landed like right in, in north south and was going for an arm bar as the uh, horn sounded. And you could just tell that Moises was like, okay, there's no way I can beat this guy. Yeah, I, I agree with you saying like it was it was decisive. So I was thinking more of like like damage done. Like I think about like it wasn't a a tree falling on a house. It was termite damage, slowly just chipping away, biting at That's it, a, and then suddenly mm-hmm. you got a hole in the side of your house. You got the same hole in the side of your house as you would have if a tree fell through it. Just took instead of ten seconds, it took ten years. I think that's a and great just, way to put it. And I just think that uh, the reason why it was somewhat competitive was simply Makhachev just, just didn't turn up the gas. He was cruising. He's a guy that he was winning the inches. And suddenly the mm-hmm. inches turn into feet. And then suddenly the feet turns into yards and, and so forth. Like That's how I felt this was. Uh, I know I, I picked I actually picked a fourth-round stoppage. Uh, what, what did you pick? Did you pick a decision or did you pick a stoppage? Oh, man, I believe I went with a uh, decision after it was all said and done just because Moises hadn't been finished yet in his career. But uh, you look awfully smart for, for making that call. Yeah, no, after my picks tonight, I, I can't brag. I only went 5-5 five and five in the end. I had two two big upsets, and neither one came through for me. Two, both of them actually uh, got finished pretty easily. Uh, w- so we are live on YouTube. If you want to join us, comment. We, we have the comments open. We try to read as many as we can, try to make this as interactive as possible. We get it that it's it's 1.14 a.m. Some people might not be as talkative as usual. This is a later card than, than we've been getting used to, uh, for a fight night at least. But let me ask you this question. So Islam Makhachev has kind of got to the point where you mentioned that Tiago Moises briefly had his back, in you said, in the second round. And mm-hmm. briefly, I mean, we're talking about seconds. Seconds. Is he getting to the point where you have seconds of six sex against him? It seems like you did okay. Am I am I falling for that a little bit? Even though I think at one point they were in the third period. I uh, third third period. What am I talking about? Third. I, I've been watching. Uh, I'm getting I'm getting ready for uh, international wrestling in the Olympics. Uh, third <laughs> third round, and Moises I think had like eleven significant strikes. So that's. You know, no, I think you're it. absolutely right. Like uh, he's. Uh, Makachev is reaching that sort of airtight phase in his uh, development. And that's it sounds weird to say when you think that his one career loss was a defensive lapse where he just got caught by a huge overhand right that the current version of him would smell out a mile away. But like I said on the preview, and, and I mean, it's not like you didn't say it as well. That's a, that's an, a window that's closed. Like, Going from here on out, no lesser fighter is ever going to beat Islam Makachev that no, way. He's, I, I he's become airtight. Yeah. No, obviously, anybody can get their bell wrong with one shot. But, yeah, I, I agree that it's, it's it's very unlikely that someone lower in the rankings would, would catch him. I mean, obviously, you could have those Matt Serra-type uh, matches. Oh, uh, six fifteen a.m. for Arlo. I, I'm not. I'm not sure where where he is. Uh, that obviously, that must that must be European. I don't know if he's England or or whatever, whatever great European country. But uh, thanks for thanks for listening, Arlo. Uh, uh, he's talking about the size difference. I agree. Like, Islam looked big. I don't know yep. if Islam is a really big lightweight. Because, I mean, he stands next to Habib and he looks small. But right. But Habib makes it. And, and, of course, Habib is not 155 anymore. But I don't know if it's that or is Tiago Moises really should be a, like a featherweight. I don't know. What do you I think? Don't- I don't think of Tiago Moises as small. I think of Islam Makachev as big. And he and Khabib have the same body type where they have a really long torso, you know, and just kind of semi-broad shoulders and and the V-taper. They're big dudes. The thing that alarmed me most this week was seeing one of the hype real things. And he was – and Islam was standing directly across from Daniel Cormier. And obviously Daniel Cormier is a barrel chested dude, but in just in terms of like their height and where their shoulders fall and the general width of their shoulders, he's basically the same size as (laughs) your recent heavyweight champion. (laughs) Heavyweight champion, yeah. They're big dudes. (laughs) Yeah, they're just different. So Arlo says he's out in England. Uh, Yeah, definitely. I credit anybody who, who, you know, watches if they're in America right now, one 17 a.m. where I am. Obviously, the West Coast is a little different. If you're in England and you're watching this at 6.15 in the morning, 6.17 in the morning, uh, yeah, you, you're definitely as hardcore. So thanks thanks so much. Uh, so one thing that stood out to me is the reason why I believe Moises was so inactive at times is that 
Makashev had him really, I wrote down reactionary. Like he had him having to react to him instead of going for his own offense. And I think it was the threat of it taking down threat of getting pressed against the cage uh, in the, you know, Dagestani handcuff that I, I, what do we call, what are we calling that where they wrap up their legs? You know, these, these type of positions that just seem, you know, terrible to be in. I think he was so worried about that. And that's why we didn't see enough more of the offense. Cause you know, that's how takedowns come when you, you unload, you drop on and they take down. I think that's what was happening. He was gun shy because of the threat of the tank down. I agree. And considering that he didn't actually go for his first takedown in earnest until pretty late in the first round, the amount of pressure that Makachev was laying on the feet, just the way he was marching forward, just like the Terminator doing a good job of uh, cutting off the cage. So just constantly backing Moises during up to the cage where you could tell Moises was constantly concerned about his own position in relation to the cage behind him. Yeah. It goes hand in hand with what you're saying, because that also, if that's constantly in your mind, you're like, am I safe planting and trying to throw a punch now? Like, God forbid, a kick. Or yeah. am I going to or is he going to rush me into the cage as soon as I square up? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it all he, played into it. He didn't seem comfortable the whole time. Even when he was striking, he was throwing one strike at a time. The only uh, on the feet, the only thing from Makachev, I kind of mentioned this earlier. I want to mention again. I He threw a lot of one strikes. I think he was landing pretty Easily, I think that happens when you're such a takedown threat that people are so worried about takedowns that they opens up the hands. I think we could talk about that uh, with Hadafo Vieira later. It's kind of kind of a similar thing. I wish he would have thrown more hands. I wish he would have opened up with combination more, especially when Moises was you know with his back towards the cage. You know, it's a lot harder. You kind of got a trapped trapped animal in the corner. Like you know, don't let him let him, don't let him off that. Like you got him against backed up against the cage. Throw a combination. That's that's probably my only uh, beef. But on the ground, uh, it was absolutely masterful. Um, inching, you know, he, he he doesn't do the damage that Habib does, but he inches, he holds positions. Um, it was like a really, it was like a slow grapple. Does that make sense? Like you don't, you weren't, you weren't getting these high scrambles. You were getting inch, inch. Yeah, what he has in common with Khabib right now is that. Like you say, he's he's not as heavy in terms of the damage he's inflicting, but he advances position without ever giving any up. Like yeah. you're you, almost nobody ever like bursts out into a better position against him. Like it, if if he passes your full guard, it's hard to stuff him back to full guard. Yeah. You know, if, if he moves to mount, it's hard to stick him back to half guard. It, it's hard to get any other way out than like giving your back. It just it's a relentless approach, and it's. It's got to be demoralizing. Like we were saying in the preview, it must suck to fight this guy. And since jo Doug Smith just popped up in the chat, this plays into what uh, into what we've been saying. He's putting Islam's post-fight quote there. Yeah, I great. have a question. Why all these guys run? You know, nobody wants to take this fight. Just give me answer. One, that's an extremely Khabib-type piece yeah, of I, trash I talk. I thought the same but thing. This it is was... why they run. Because almost any other top prospect top contender you're like you know what i might be a huge underdog but i can do this or i can do this or i can do that there's just no silly way to beat these guys yeah if if the ufc when islam market shows say he headlines a, a ufc pay-per-view if they don't use that quote in the pro promotion they blow it like yep. it, it it's got to be um just something that fans say when with islam talks and i could see say say he fights we'll just say Say he fights for the title one day. Say he's fighting Charles Oliver. The whole thing should be Islam talking about no one wants to fight me. Everyone's scared. Talking to Paul Felder. And then you zoom over to Charles Oliver like, like I'll fight him. You know, or something like, you know, yep. like, like, that's. So let me ask you this. We'll get, I really want to get into the marketing of Islam because I think, well, he's not the most exciting fighter. I definitely think, as you mentioned, a great quote like that. There is ways to really market him. Do you feel better, worse, or the same an hour ago about, you know, now than you did an hour ago before the fight started? Do you feel better about him moving forward or worse or the same? Just in terms of competitively and being Co a contender? Yeah, competitively better. as a contender. Better. better. But the only problem I've ever had with Islam Makachev is one of the unfortunate things that he emulates about Khabib is he doesn't fight as often as he could. Yeah. That seems to be less of a problem now as he's 
staying busy or he appears to be healthy. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel great about him because Moises was a huge underdog for a reason. Yep. But he had a whole lot of Hail Mary type potential there. I mean, he's a, a hard hitter who has all the weapons uh, in terms of striking. He's a, a very venomous submission grappler. I mean, his uh, two fights ago, he tapped out Michael Johnson in seconds after getting pieced up for most of the first round. And, and he went for the same move tonight. He had mm -hmm. a moment, I think it was, was it the third round where he was, the round ended with him trying to get a heel hook? And it was the was third, yep. Third, yeah. And, yeah, third. and Islam just kind of relaxed. He actually looked over his corner very slow, kind of like I talked about slow grapple, just was working for inches, not working, that didn't know explosive movement, kind of waited him out, landed some shots. Uh, to ask myself the same question, I would say I feel better, but only slightly better. Like he didn't do anything that wowed me where I'm saying this, this guy's going to win the title. Like I'm not willing to say he's going to win the title yet. Same note, I don't know if I would pick anybody over him right now, if that makes sense. Like I'm not, I, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. But what I do like is you mentioned you have Moises, who's a very crafty Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy, guy known for his jiu-jitsu, and he submits him. Yep. Like that makes me feel really good. The, it, the, the thing that would have made me feel much better about him is if he really turned it up, he was landing more strikes, uh, more output, more uh, pressure. Uh, you know, like where Habib had, it was really starting to turn it up as the fights went on in his career. If we saw something like that, I, I would have felt much better. I'm inclined to give him a somewhat of a pass for one reason. As he pointed out, and I, it was a surprise to me, this was his first fight that, uh, of beyond three rounds. I could see him being a little more conservative than usual, just thinking he might need to manage his gas. If he comes out in his next you know, five round fight and he's more aggressive and he starts to weaponize his pace and cardio like Khabib does or did, uh, that would be, I mean, that, that would answer that question for me. I'm inclined to give him a little bit of a pass on the first try at a five round fight. Yeah, I agree. Well, the one thing I do like that we didn't see him slowing down, like getting a finish in the fourth, you know, if he got to finish in the fourth, fifth round, like I feel much better. He got to finish in, in the championship rounds. That made me feel good. You didn't see him breathing hard at all. I mean, the way he was doing the interview with Paul Felder at the end, you know, uh, it made me feel pretty good. Uh, Arlo wants to talk about what's next. Let's hold off on that for one second, Arlo. Uh, we usually like to finish the segment with that. But I want to talk about marketing with him because obviously he, this is his first main event. Didn't get a lot of press push on this because, let's be honest, a week ago was Conor McGregor and you have that. You get through a Conor McGregor week and it's you, – you need. A, I need a couple of days. Most people need a couple of days, you know. So mm – -hmm. You know, they've really been pressing the TJ Dillashaw return, too. So it's kind of sandwiched in between the two. This would be how I would mark it. I was, I was at a Bellator show last night, I was, and we were talking. I was talking with Bellator PR people and, and a couple media members, and they really like how I, view, how I look at things marketing-wise. And, and this is how I would market him. And, and it, I think it's really obvious. It's, it's Habib 2.0. It's, it's the next Habib. It's Russian, Dagestan, same team, teacher, student, Mr. Miyagi, Dan Danielson kind of thing. You know, uh, right, he learns from Habib. And then when you're doing the promo, you have Sean Sel Shelby. You go to him talking about how it's so hard for him to find a matchup because nobody wants to fight this guy. He's the boogeyman. You know, and then you go to Chill Son and talking about he, you know, he reminds me of Habib. But he's, he might even be a better striker than he'd be, you know, or or something like that. Like, that's what I do. Or, or when you're doing a promo, find something that Habib, you know, because because casual fans know who he is now. Show something that Habib does and then find Makhachev doing the same exact thing and put him side to side. You know, Habib having someone press against a cage, punching him and showing Makhachev doing the same thing, you know, or a big slam takedown by Habib and have right at the same exact time, time it up, sync it up, or Makachev is slamming the guy at the same exact time and just make it that. Make Habib, get a clip of Habib talking about him. Get it, you know, and do all this. Like, that's how I would market him. You agree with me or would you do a different angle? Like, what would you go? Well, that's almost the only way they can do it unless they are just going to wait until the same thing happens that really took Khabib over the top, which is that he ran into a Conor McGregor and he picked yeah. up some of that shine by beating him. But right now Assuming in the division, you don't have that. 
Exactly. Well, and I mean, you do have, you actually have the actual guy, but he's yeah. on a losing streak and he's going to be on the sidelines for who knows long. And frankly, we may never have a Conor McGregor type again. Like the yeah. UFC is clearly trying to move into a post superstar phase where they, they don't have a single Conor McGregor or John Jones who can have him over a barrel like yeah. the current ones do. Well, you know how I feel about that. We've talked about that. I, I believe this is a star driven sport. You need to build stars. But the, we're not talking about that at 128. <laughs> you know, we're not going to go down. No. We, a lot of times we go down rabbit holes. Let's not go down that one. Uh, mm-hmm. I love saying the same thing. Like, you need a rival. I get that. But I, I, I really think you just make it like, oh, you guys miss Habib? Well, we got we got a new Habib. Even show Habib retiring. Maybe mm-hmm. even focus with Habib announcing retiring. And you have, you know, you, you, you fade out Habib and you got Islam behind him. And you kind of fade him in kind of thing. <laughs> you know, or... You know, you're showing pictures of them training the arms around each other and something. And then ultimately, he goes on a big streak. He wins the title, and somehow you get Habib to come back and fight him. That's that. <laughs> the, that's, make a, yeah. you, you somehow get them to hate each other. And that's that's how you do. You do Rocky, Rocky number five. <laughs> but but I guess they'd have to fight out in the uh, back alley or something like Rocky five. But um, so let's talk. What's next? Uh, what's next for him? Uh, he called out RDA. He called out Michael Chandler. How do you? Let's talk about this. I know you have a, a guy in mind, but how do you feel about those matchups? I think both of those are very appropriate if you believe the eyeball test, because the eyeball test tells you that Islam Makachev is the top five lightweight right now. Agreed. What he's actually accomplished on his resume tells you that he's more around the ten spot. Like if you want to go with just who sure. they've beaten and how. Gregor Gillespie's win over Diego Fajeda is a better win than any of Islam Makachev's. So why wouldn't they fight next? Or get get him with someone like Dan Hooker, who's a former top five guy who just took a loss and is dropping out. Now, I'm not recommending that. I'm going with the eyeball test here. I think Islam Makachev should, should kind of skip that tier and go straight up to, uh, I think it was Arlo who said Justin Gaethje. That's a, that's a rough thing to do to Gaethje. But... Uh, you know, like I think RDA is a is a really appropriate one actually, and so would Chandler be. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, I, Michael Chandler makes sense. That's not the guy I wrote down, but the, my thing about Michael Chandler is he lo- he just lost. You know, going for the title, he lost. Yeah, of course. We I've talked about a million times about the escalator. Where do they cross? Yeah, they're at that point. To me, at this point, is it, first of all, it's almost a terrible stylistic matchup for RDA. I mean, wrestlers have always been. We saw what Michael Kessa did to RDA. Yeah. Um, uh, I understand the Greg Gillespie, definitely the NCAA wrestler versus Stambo wrestling. That'd be really interesting. But to me, it you know, once you start headlining a show, you've you've taken a step. Even if you didn't deserve it, you've taken a step. Like he, his his resume might say, yeah, it's time for a top ten guy. But when you headline a show and you win, and you know, for the next two days, you know, you go to Sure Dog. It's articles about Islam Makhachev. You go to other websites. Which why would you go to the other website? But if you did by accident, by accident you did it. Uh, you know, their article is going to be about Islam. Makhachev. You know, it's going to be Islam Makhachev. I think the Habib connection, all that stuff. I think he goes a little high. And to me, at this point, I feel like RDA is actually a step back in a promotional sense for him. I think he should be looking at, at like a number one contender matchup. That's why I like the idea of Justin Gaethje. You know, Habib just beat Justin Gaethje his last fight. You know, obviously, Justin Gaethje's a fan favorite. You do the Habib marketing on as Makachev, what, what I would do. And that's matchup. That's that's my matchup. Uh, did, did you – I'm sorry. So, is RDA the guy that you would do if you ran the UFC or uh, – I would be fine with, uh, with RDA. I'd also be fine with Gaethje. I'm just like, wow, you know, that's, that's a rough look for Gaethje. But I'm interested in the fight. Because when Gaethje fought uh, fought Khabib, you know, I, I was like, okay, this is one of the best leg kickers in the sport. Uh, you know, a very good wrestler. But it didn't matter that he was a very good wrestler. You know, Khabib was just too good. It just it doesn't it doesn't matter almost. You know, he he's never really like since like the Glyson Tebow fight a million years ago. He hasn't really ever failed to get somebody to the canvas that he wanted to. The difference between Makachev and Nurmagomedov is 
Makachev isn't quite the explosive athlete, isn't quite as strong as uh, Khabib was, especially there towards the end, and probably not quite like he's just a just a little uh, bit behind him in terms of his pure wrestling. Yeah, right? both maybe a- that's maybe that's enough because if Gaethje can keep it standing, <clears throat> it's a real interesting fight. Yeah, they're both a chainsaw, but one is the one you buy at Home Depot. The other one's the one you buy at the specialized chain star store. You know what I mean? If that, if that if, I don't know if that makes. If that, I think sure. that analogy went better in my head than than that when it came <laughs> out. Um, Doug Doug Smith mentioned uh, the Benil Darius. That's a fight that he thinks would make it. That, yeah, I mean, when you when you look at lightweight top ten rankings, there's not there's never a bad matchup. So like, every matchup yep. that people have mentioned right now, like it's not bad. Like if they if RDA is the fight or Benil Darius, whoever, like I'm not mad. It's 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 a fantastic division. Everything's gonna be good. Um, I always tend to look at it as if I'm a promoter, then like fan wise. That's when we talked about the Robbie Lawler, Nate, uh, Nick Diaz. Yeah. I'm probably the only person in the world thinking that's a terrible promotional move, but um, not to go down that rabbit hole. Um, let me ask you this, and I know this is very unfair, but who would you, f- not saying who would you pick? Over is like Makhachev, but right now his next fight. If if you did a futures line, you know future better line, who in the top five would be favored over him right now? You think? I don't know if anybody would be. I don't know if they would either. And I'm not saying I agree. I'm not saying I'm not I would saying personally I favor either. him to beat Charles Oliveira or Justin Gaethje. Yep. Uh, but I could see him being. You know, at least even money against both those guys. Yeah, I agree. I I, I totally agree. And and you know, I love living in the moment. It's it's more. I know. I know. I live in the moment. But it's more fun when you live in the moment too. Um, how about Tiago Moises? This guy, he's only twenty five years old. He's the youngest guy fighter on the entire card, which was very interesting. Uh, you know, I'm not writing him off yet. You know, he automatically gets a little more shine on him just by being in the in a main event. You know, this wasn't a, a Devin Clark. You fell into it because the main event got canceled. Like, he was scheduled. Uh, when you look at his resume, he probably shouldn't be touching anybody near the top 15. But when you headline the UFC, it kind of happens. Like, you're not going to fall too far down. So what would you do with um, – what would you with um, Moises? You know what? I, I agree. And, he, I mean, he he's actually 26. But, yeah, still uh, uh, youngest guy in the card – Young enough to be uh, Marion Renault's kid. Uh, <laughs> I'd give him with somebody on the outskirts of the top 10, top 15, who's coming off a loss as well. Maybe someone like Drew Dober. Drew Dober. Um, yeah. 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 That makes sense because that's – it's it's still a step up from Alex Hernandez who we just beat. Yeah. But it's still a big step down from Makhachev who obviously, you know. Uh, right. Um, the, the name I wrote down was Brad Riddell. Who just beat Dober. Yeah. Met it, you know, they're kind of in the same range. Guys trying to crack it into the, you know, the shirt on top 15. Uh, that's what I would do. Um, anything else we should say about this? I think we're going to be, it might be a quicker night than usual. Yeah. I, uh, Doug Smith said that he would favor Poirier, but not by much. I like that as well. Yeah. I get that. He's, you know, obviously Poirier's, I mean, Poirier's down. I'm at Bellator last night and half the questions are any, anybody from America top team, all the questions about Dustin Poirier, you know, like he's, He's hot right now. Yeah. And and Poirier, it's the same question as Gaethje. Like, it didn't matter how much his wrestling had improved when he took on Khabib, but if he's good enough to keep it standing at least for a while against Makachev, that makes things really, really interesting. Yeah. I really want someone to poison the camp of, of – not physically poison. I mean, spread rumors around the Habib camp and somehow get a beef between Habib and Islam. Like that – if this was pro, if 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 you know that's one of the people who say, uh, you know, Vince McMahon has said one issue that UFC will always have is that they can't, you know, guarantee script. the winners. They can't script it. If you could script it, you tell me that wouldn't be the script. Oh, he does a Peter heel turn. He moves to Ireland. He moves to Ireland and like oh. goes and starts training with McGregor. Oh God. Teacher versus student type beef. And oh, please UFC, do not book him against. Don't don't do the. You know, Habib versus Connor is all. Let's do let's do Connor versus Makashev. Uh, don't do that. What? Uh, someone mentioned Tony Ferguson. I I, I I apologize. I have to scroll up to see who it was. Uh, Alexander mentioned Tony Ferguson. He was saying he was making a different point than what I'm about to make. 
but if you really want to do the Habib thing, you could try to do Islam instead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and how ironic would that be if 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 you had Habib in Islam's corner watching him beat up Tony Ferguson <laughs> instead of it actually, and then when the fight's over and you have, you know Tony Ferguson has to go up and shake the corner's hand and stuff, and he's shaking. Uh, I don't know. We're going we're going off. Uh, speaking of strange. Uh, it was strange to see Misha Tate back in there. It's been five years, or was it four and a half years since she last competed? She yep. returned against Marion Renault, who one person was returning, one person was having their last fight as Marion Renault re- retired. If you if you trust MMA retirements at forty four years old, like I trust this more than most. Uh, Misha Tate won by third round TKO. I'm gonna say this. I was floored by Misha Tate's performance tonight. I thought she looked faster than she did when she left. I, you know, four and a half years ago, I thought her output was much. You know, one thing I was breaking down the film was throwing one strike at a time. That was not the case. She was throwing combinations. She was fast. She moved, mixed in takedowns. She was fighting off, you know, her sub defense against the, you know, all the subs that Marion Rowe was throwing up. To me, what she did tonight was like best case scenario. Like, this is what you could possibly dream for in return. And then she did it. I'm glad to hear you say that because I was super, super impressed by what I saw. And I worried that I was going to be the dork that came crashing in here and was like, she's back. She's better than ever. But you agree with me. So thank goodness. She was well, faster it's than before. It's Marino. It's 44-year-old Marino. So it's take a regret of salt. But I still feel it's, like that's it, a good win right now. It's a good win. It's not just – because it's Renault, like, you know, Renault had been on a losing streak, but again, competitive losses to top 10 fighters. Uh, you, you said Tate looked faster. She looked stronger. Like Tate, like had muscles on her shoulders and arms and back yeah. that she did not have four years ago. Uh, you said that her striking looked much better throwing in combination, uh, straighter, quicker punches, better footwork, uh, even on the ground. I mean, obviously she was a wrestler by trade. Yeah during her prime into, you know, when she won the title, but she wasn't this physically overpowering type. She wasn't, she wasn't Ronda Rousey. Uh, you know, she got by on grit and good technique and persistence. She picked up Marion Renault and slammed her. Like this is the best, like the best performance of Misha Tate's career. I like, obviously it's not her biggest win. No, of course. You know, she, she won the title, but she won the title by choking out Holly Holm after getting pieced up. And that's like, a this much was just different domination. Holly Holm. That was a much yeah. different Holly Holm back then. Holly Holm is much yeah. better on the ground now than she was back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I, you know, I'm not gonna say it's the best performance of her career because I have to really look at her record and, and and try to remember, put myself back at that time. You're going back six, eight, you know, ten years ago. But off the top of my head, it was one of her best performances. As again, we're not saying it was her best win. Obviously, winning the title is her best win. But overall, like wow, I was I was really really impressed. Um, let me ask you this question: When I watched Misha Tate do what she did tonight, I kept thinking the same thought, and my thought was, if somehow we could get Ronda Rousey back, Ronda Rousey's still a top ten in the division. Yep, it, it it would be very stylistically dependent, but there'd be women in the top five she could absolutely beat, and then women on the outskirts of the top ten who would just embarrass her. Yeah, maybe, but I, I yeah, well, wait, that, that's not good on the Ronda Rousey route, but I, it, especially because I don't think that's gonna happen. But um, what about what what are we doing with Misha moving forward? Like it's it's really tough because to me it's a sh- it's a very shallow division, which means like one or two wins in this. Girl, I mean, she's a bit, she's one of the biggest names in the division. She probably is the biggest name in the division other than uh, Amanda, um, Amanda Nunes and and probably Holly Holm, but she's right up there. What what would you do with her? Like, what would her next fight be? And she's talking about if, making a championship run, so she's this wasn't a one and done. If you want to go, like, for, like, poetic, you know, like, storyline, you make a home rematch. If you want yeah. to, to – and for one thing, if she beats Holm, she is in line for title shot because Holm mm. is still, still so good at 39 that she's gatekeeping two divisions at the same time right now. Yeah. Like, she's swatted away – three or four women that the UFC really, really wanted to get title shots. Mm-hmm. Like Megan Anderson, like that was a big problem that she just, destroyed, yeah. you know, uh, 
it, so that that would be one to do. Otherwise, uh, you know, the winner of Macy Chasson and Aspen Ladd, if she can yeah. beat that person, she's she's a top five bantamweight right now. If you don't feel if you feel like bringing her along a little more slowly than that, if you're like, OK, a a win over a woman coming off four straight losses who's 44 years old, that doesn't get you into a title eliminator, then do the Vieira versus McMahon winner. Yeah, okay. Like Caitlin Vieira and Sarah McMahon are fighting in a couple weeks. The winner of that, I mean, McMahon versus uh, Tate is one I always wanted to see six years ago anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I would do a much slower route too. Like I would do, you know, it's tough. I'm looking at the division. There's a lot of people booked. A lot of people, you know, it's kind of hard. But like I would do like a Jessica Rose Clark. Like I, I don't want are you instant – but I don't expect that at all. I expect it to get thrown up. Doug mentions Irene Aldana. I, I actually think that's the fight next. Like I think they're gonna book that next. Or oh, they could that, do a Holly they could do a Holly Holm. I I still want I mean she beat Marion Renault. Let's like let's not rush it. I would do Jessica Rose Clark. You know, someone much lower down, a Betch Cohea, something like that. Like that's what I would do. I don't expect that at all. I expect her to be thrown right to the wolves right away. Like it would, I'm not expecting it, and I really hope this happens. But it, like it wouldn't shock me if her next fight is a Manny Nunes. Like that would not like if they announce like after Manny Nunes smokes John Pena and there's really no one else leading the pack. If they throw her in there, like I wouldn't be. I'd be like, no. really UFC, but yeah, I'm not surprised. Ooh. But now if if uh, if Pena does the upset for the age and beats Nunes, then you got real interest because. Those two are former training partners. They were friends from like the Seattle area. Uh, Tate picked her first overall on Tough. Like, oh, oh you know, yeah, that, yeah. The problem yeah. is, but you, there's a big, ma- major, major problem you're forgetting about. That Pena's the, not going to win. Pena's not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ruin my hypothetical, man. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, normally I would pass by her, but it's her, it was her last fight. Um, I'll say this about Mary now. Really classy woman. You, you know, interview. She seemed very likable. Um, but I feel like this fight really summed up a lot of things. When I'll think about Marion right now, I don't know if I will think about her. <laughs> you know, ten years from now. But if someone mentioned her, single strikes on the feet, getting taken down, and then playing jujitsu instead of scrambling. Uh, that's what happened in this fight. And that kind of just to me sums up Marion Renault. What What would you think about Marion Renault? This this is going to sound cruel to say, but yeah, like she will be remembered more as the answer to multiple trivia questions five or 10 years from now. Yeah. Like she's always going to have some places in the UFC record book just because of what she did. So like at such an advanced stage, but she's essentially a 500 fighter, even if she was a 500 fighter fighting the best fighters in the world who were 10 years younger than her for most of her career. Uh she was a great neutralizer. Like you talked about, you know, throwing single strikes on the feet, giving up takedowns, playing jujitsu. But we just saw her, that was the first time she got finished in her, in her entire career. Yeah, that's a good point. Just real good at making a fight Surviving. never get out of second gear. Just a good. Yeah. 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 But that's, yeah, it, 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 it's like when she was like the, the carnival ride that you, that was the one, the little teacups you spin yourself. And it's really cool when you're like seven, but when you're like 13, you're like, you're just like, why? Wow, I wish these spun really much faster. Like, that's her. Like, oh, yeah, this is cool, but man, like, can't this go faster? Like, that's Mary Renault to me. Uh, I, I definitely give her credit. 44 years old. I mean, that's incredible. You, you, you know, she'll always be one of those ones you ask the question, like, what would have happened if she was younger? You know, if she was 27, if she started younger? Who knows? Maybe we're talking about Mary Renault champion like oh i can't wait to see marino versus manunia or something like that but unfortunately that's not the cards we were dealt she got in the sport extremely late and, and did as as well as she could have speaking of uh old and struggling jeremy stevens and, and and speaking of not being finished in a long time jeremy stevens got submitted for the first time since 2009 by matus gamarot gamarot got a first round submission I, I, I mean, I, this is the guy that both of us were really high on. We both liked him. We both picked him. We both said, you know, change him in the guard. But it's still like that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, Stevens basically did nothing 
like he did he did nothing like he did nothing but uh kind of survive for a few seconds once it hit the ground like just complete domination by Mateusz Gamrot my and tell me if i'm wrong here it, it's this is great in that he beat an, a recognizable name in the ufc but yeah. competitively this is a step back from scott holtzman um i'll say this i don't know if it's a step back and what I'll say about that is it's unfair to Jeremy Stevens because he's always been matched up the highest in the division. So I don't really know how much Jeremy Stevens has fallen. You know what I mean? Because he's – you go through his record, yeah, he's lost five in a row, but they're all studs. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I don't know if if Jeremy Stevens' next fight is Scott Holtzman, Scott Holtzman beats him, like that would shock me. And that's probably the level he's at now. So I'll say at best it, it, it it's probably a lateral move. In talent wise, but for name value, for performance, for you know, getting a first round, a a uh, a Kimura, you know, a, a move we don't see get finished a lot. It, for a little extra money in his pocket at the end of the night, I do have the bonuses. Okay, let's finish up talking about Gamera, then we'll, we'll get to the All bonuses. Right. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, I mean. I saw people tweeting out from Europe. They're they're all high on this guy. I'm sure. I'm sure our buddy Arlo is is high on him. You know, our our, our British friend. And uh, yeah, I mean, you. No matter what you feel about Jeremy Stevens, to take him out that quick is, is really special. I want to match make him, and the reason why I didn't like the RDA matchup is I felt like RDA was a step back. But when you beat Jeremy Stevens, you need to step up. And because you beat Jeremy Stevens, you beat a name. You beat someone that everyone know. Everyone knows who Jeremy Stevens is, except for Conor McGregor. Everybody else knows who he is. Um, that was a better joke, like, but better, better joke five years ago. But uh, I would give Gamera RDA. Am I out of my mind? Is that too big of a step up? I think it's a big step up, but I I'm not against it. And it's interesting because for Gamera, uh, Brad Riddell was actually a name that I had down. Oh, that's a great fight. Or the winner of uh, Rafael Fizia versus Bobby Green in a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're both great fights. Yeah. But like competitively, that is probably better. But name wise, it's not better for him. It's weird. Like you, no. when you beat a Jeremy Stevens and we don't know where he is, it's tough for the. Like I'll give the matchmakers credit. It's tough to make a match where it doesn't seem like it's a step back. You know? But yeah. also not unfair to this guy where it's wow he shouldn't be fighting this guy yet agreed and the nice thing about Gamrod is he's not some seven in one guy he's got like over 20 fights under his belt you know they can put him against uh, a guy like RDA and it won't be that he's like nervous and out of his depth he's either better than RDA right now or he's not yeah I feel like I feel about him the same way I feel like like Yuri Prochaska like his international wins mean a lot you know what I mean? Like he, it's it's mm-hmm. not, it's not the guy coming in from LFA with, no. you know, Don't. 20, 20 fights. It's guys. KS, KSW was legit. Yeah, it's it's not UFC, but it's one step below, and mm-hmm. it's the, the the highest guys there are UFC level for sure. Yeah, I and mean, we've seen that time and time and again. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the Hadafo Vera fight. Let's. Do you want me to guess the awards, or do you want to just announce them? There are six of them, so okay, let me just throw them out. Them. They, so yeah. Pretty much everybody got an award. Everyone got a finish, got an award. <laughs> yeah, there were 20 fights on the card, or 20 fighters on the card, six got an award. Uh, fight of the night, Gabe, uh, Gabriel Benitez versus Billy Quarantello. Agreed. Oh, pff, yeah. Uh, performances of the night, Misha Tate. Yep. Rodolfo Vieira. Amanda Lemos. Uh, Rodrigo Nascimento and Mateusz Gamrot. Lemos gets nothing. What? What? <laughs> you one shot a girl in, I don't know how many seconds it was, like basically your first punch thrown. You one shot a girl, knock her out, and you don't get it. That's, how it's, that, that's the first one. If I'm if if I'm the UFC, it say there's, there's a one fight bonus. That's it. Just one. You can give, this is your MVP. This is your one person. She's my pick. Like what? Maybe they th- maybe they thought the stoppage was weird and that took some shine off it. I don't know because I'm with you. Like, how do you not? All right, read it. So you have the fight of the night, 
you had Misha Tate, you had who was it, Makashev? No, Gamrot. Gamrot, Adolfo Vieira, that we're about to talk about, and Rodrigo Nascimento in the opener. I think you could make an argument. Danny Rodriguez makes deserves it over uh, Nascimento, over Adolfo Vieira. I'm. Anyways, I'm. Dude, I'm I'm with you. I'm surprised that Vieira got the check. Not, and we're about to talk about his fight, but dude, he got a really slick back take and a nice sub after a kind of weird and nervous looking fight. Yeah, you know, yeah. Okay. Adolfo Vieira versus Dustin Stolpitz. So, you seem like it was a weird fight. Let me ask you this: going into the third round, how did you have the fight scored? I had it one one, and right. I thought both of the. I wouldn't have been completely upset at either guy being up two rounds to nothing. Like I, I was I like, if this thing goes to if this thing goes to the judges, this has splitter written all over it. I agree. I agree. So I'll say this about Hadaf Vera. I liked a lot of things. Well, it wasn't this unbelievable performance. I mean, I guess I guess the UFC thinks it is because he did get the uh, bonus. But uh, so so Arlo saying D Rod looked great. Uh, he had a mismatch last. I I don't disagree with it. I like Preston Parsons, uh, but I think Dr. just came through. Uh, I mean, I understand he's saying short notice, absolutely, but yeah, I, I like Preston Parsons' future in the UFC. Uh, some things I liked. This can be huge improvements in his striking in a really really quick time. You know, the last time we saw him really strike on the feet, you had like Saparek Safarov hurting him to where he might have been winning the stand-up against Stolpitz. He, he had a quick, fast jab. I like that the, that Paul Felder was talking about. There wasn't a lot of tells. They were all short. He had a nice short right hand, um, clean high guard. Some some things he's still got to clean up. He lacks head movement, keeps his chin a little high. But I like that he learned how to conserve energy, pretty much take moments off in the fight to re kind of – they were like the old like, sight bike – where do you remember the excite bike? You had to like run yes. it, and if you held the like the B button too long, you would overheat. So you had to go to the A button and let it go down. You start slowing down a little bit, and then yep. you get down a little bit. Like all right, now I can kind of boost. So he's like, he, that should be his, his new nickname, Adolfo the Excite Bike Vera. Uh, but yeah, his wrestling. He's a power wrestler for Jitsu guy. We saw that in the third round where he just blast doubled, almost speared him, almost almost uh. Who was it? Yeah. Who was it? Who was the pro wrestler that used to spear? Uh, Go Goldberg. He almost Goldberg them. Yeah. Right. That was right. Goldberg. Right. Yeah. It was Goldberg. Okay, yeah. Because Goldberg was a former, you know, NFL defensive tackle. He just shot right through his hips like a defensive lineman. Yeah. Yeah. And he has that, and then he finished him with an insane like, you know, early in the fight he got a takedown on that stuff. Which stuff was able to get up. That wasn't the case in the third round, and that back take at the end was so slick. That that showed you what level. That reminded everybody what kind of grapple this is. And that is something he would not have been able to pull off three minutes into his fight with uh, Fluffy Hernandez. Yeah. So, so I agree with you. And Yeah, go ahead. Well, you, you – I, I know you watch at least a certain amount of grappling. You know, I, I, I watch a pretty good amount of grappling. High level – I mean, even at the highest levels of grappling, there are moments in a match where – you know, it's a relatively neutral or transitional position, and one or both guys can take a little bit of a breather. Yeah. Like, it's a different rhythm learning when those moments are in a mixed martial arts contest. You know, especially positions like, you know, working for a takedown, clinched against the cage, things like that. So if, if he's if he's mastering that, if he's turned some sort of corner there, that says that that means really different things about his next couple performances. Yeah, and you you have that all types of discipline like in boxing. Like I remember when I first was starting in box, and I was boxing with like pro boxers. I'd get super gassed out. And I'm like, man, why is my cardio so bad? And then I would wrestle like the same guy, and he'd be super gassed out, and I wouldn't. And then we talked about, well, that's because you're wasting energy, and I'm wrestling in this position. <laughs> And vice versa in boxing. Like, oh, yeah, you're wasting energy. You're throwing all power shots, and I'm just attaching. That's why you're gassing out, you know? And, mm -hmm. yeah, I get that. He's 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 learned how to conserve his energy in jiu-jitsu, and now he's got to learn how to conserve his energy. And, may, and, and we saw that a little bit today. You know, getting the third round finished makes you feel a lot better than you did last time you saw him fight. Yep. So I feel much – I feel very good about him moving forward. 
just the jumps and improvement he's made, I feel really good. Are you, are you with me? Or are you like still? You still? I feel better about okay. him. I, I don't feel good about him yet. I feel better about him. He he made all those things work on a fighter in Dustin Stoltzfus that the jury's still out on whether he's UFC material. Sure. He's definitely um, low-level UFC. Right. Uh, now, if that same, like, if that jab is, like, splitting open, like, solid 185ers, <laughs> if he's yeah. able to, you know, put it on people on the ground in the third round that are, like, legit middleweights, yeah, this guy's a whole different kind of problem. Absolutely. We're not going to matchmake him. We're not going to do all that. We're not going to matchmake the whole card, but... Uh... I, I definitely feel much better about him. Uh, speaking of, of guys who look much better, Billy Quintero looked much better than I expected him tonight. He was absolutely fantastic against Gabriel Benitez. So some things that really stood out to me, and, and I'll let you jump in in a second, but one that he never allowed Benitez to get his jab going. When Benitez was throwing his jab, it was landing, it was hurting him, but he never got to get like, okay, now I'm going to settle in with the jab. Like, oh, I got two or three off. And Quarantillo realized that, and next minute he's closing distance, shooting a takedown, or blasting with a right hand. The right hand was on; it was on target. He had the, the kick. Or talk about the kicks of Gabriel Tennis. I don't. He didn't get a chance to throw those because Quarantillo had him fighting off his back foot. You talk. The broadcast talked about this. We talked about this. He uses cardio as a weapon. We said his last fight he didn't use his cardio, and now it just seems like that was an outlier. Something was wrong. Um. Clean right hand. I love this takedown. I love his body triangle that he was like instantly put in body triangle. I th- I felt like everything for Billy Quintero was perfect tonight, except for the weird call out of Charles Rosa. Like to me, that's a step behind. I didn't get that, but everything else was perfect for Quintero. What would you think? Oh, I mean, I got a couple of fights wrong tonight in terms of picking the winner. This is the only one where I was I. I picked this dead wrong in terms of what the fight would look like because I expected the dynamic of this fight to be, okay, Quarantillo is a pressure guy. He is going to march forward and be in Benitez's face, and between his jab and his leg kicks, Benitez is just going to put him through the wood chipper. It ended up being pretty much the exact opposite of that. He got in on Benitez and landed shots on him whenever he wanted to, uh, was able to get the fight to the ground when he wanted to, and just completely ran game on him once they got to the ground. Uh, My... My only real question about it, and regardless of what the answer to this question is, it doesn't take anything away from Quarantillo. But, I mean, he landed a hard right hand on Benitez early on, knocked him down, and yeah. it seemed like after that Benitez never got out of first gear. Yeah. Now, I want, if if this is the way the fight was going to look anyway, great. If, if that just knocked Benitez out of sorts and that's part of the reason he couldn't get on track, well, that still looked good for Quarantillo because he's the one that punched him in the face. Uh, just, it did leave me wondering, does it look so unexpected because Quarantillo just, you know, everybody's got a game plan until they get punched in the mouth, you know, as Mike Tyson said, was yeah. it that? Or did I just really have these two guys that wrong? Yeah, I... Yeah, I don't know. It might have been that. He might have been hurt and never re- recover. The fact that we didn't see any leg kicks makes me feel like he was hurt the whole fight. I mean, his eye was pretty much closed up by the end of it. I mean, he was beat up. Uh, before we move on, Arlo says he likes the Charles Rosa call out, saying that he sees a close, see them close in the ability to style. I don't. I, I think Cortella would, would style on Charles Rosa, even though I'm a Boston guy myself. Uh, I'm not that high on Charles Rosa uh, as as a prospect. I actually think Benitez is better than Charles Rosa. I feel like that's a step back. Um, but, hey, that's a weird fight. I mean, it, it's not a huge step back in my opinion, but I, I, I don't know. But uh, I respect Arlo's opinion. No one should care about my opinion because I called a massive upset. I really like Preston, Par- uh, Preston Parsons as a prospect. The first minute of the fight, I was feeling really good. He was landing some clean shots. Mm-hmm. It was just a big difference in power. As when when he landed, he landed clean shots. When Danny Rodriguez landed, he hurt Preston Parsons. Yes. And Danny is a guy. He's a finisher. He's a guy that if he has you hurt, he's got that killer instinct. Mm-hmm. Like that first time he made, even made Parsons wince. You knew the the finish was coming soon. I completely agree. When uh, Parsons went down, I thought he was going to tap the canvas. Like when he, he like went down, I agree. Uh, like faced away, like fetal position, and just kind of covered up. 
I was like, oh, well, one, this is over. But two, is it even going to be over before Rodriguez can get there to finish the job? Because I, I thought he might be about to tap the mat or that the ref was just going to run in and say, OK, this this is over. Yeah. Yeah. And Danny Rodriguez, he, you know, it was a short notice replacement for him. You know, it's he's already beaten guys way more advanced than Preston Parsons or, or you know, what we least experienced in Preston, Preston Parsons. But I was still impressed because not one, one I like Preston Parsons, but also when you got a matchup like this and people expect you to win and you're our big favorite, you have to do a performance like this. You have to get him out. Yep. You have to show up at this levels. And that that's what Danny Rodriguez, his left hand is really becoming a, a, a thing of beauty. It's really becoming a signature uh, thing that people have to be worried about. Like his, he, it's a piston and he, he throws that down the pipe and it's, it really is like starting to become one of the best weapons in all of MMA. It's fantastic. And it, it goes well with what he's already got. You know, he's got some good uh, kicks. His right hand isn't bad either. So his one twos like they, they mm-hmm. land and they hurt. Yeah. He's an interesting dude who was kind of a late, bloomer afterthought when he signed with the ufc yeah that's right like no one no one was on him i, I mean people were picking to means over him and he was just a card filler kind of guy we thought he'd have a short run we thought by this point he'd already be out of the ufc and no he looks the complete opposite you know the division is so loaded and and whatnot but uh, he's got to get someone you know, he's not going to get a top 15 opponent neck, but he needs to have the people that just on the outside, the guys who are all kind of one or two wins away from getting ranked. Like, that's what Danny Rodriguez needs next. It's welterweight, man. There's a huge pool of them, and they're they're all real good. I mean, to me, if somebody isn't in the top five and you ask who they should fight next at welterweight, my automatic answer is Alex Morono. <laughs> there you go. Just, <laughs> I'm going to see how long I can keep the gag going. Well, Alex you know? Morono, obviously, I mean, I don't know if Danny Rodriguez is, is a legend enough to get Alex Barone Alex Bar- only fights legends. Anthony Pettis <laughs> and, and Donald Cerrone and um, yeah, uh, our, buddy, our, our buddy Bass just came in uh, trolling us, of course. <laughs> um, uh, Parsons, this is what I want, before I say with Parsons, I liked him as a prospect before. One thing I'm worried about moving forward is that this would be a confidence killer because this is his first fight in the UFC. He fights a guy like Danny Rodriguez. He gets hurt he, bad. And he suddenly thinks that everybody's Danny Rodriguez level. And he says, instead of being like, no, this is a really tough, really, really tough guy in my first matchup. And it's going to be easier fights. Yeah, I guess I guess his next fight will really tell us a lot. Like he needs a low level guy next fight. He needs a guy that's just kind of scraped into the UFC or by a guy who's about to scrape out of the UFC. Yeah, he, he, that, he deserves that. Yeah. Yes. Um, before that. We had an absolute robbery, uh, not before the fight, I should say, but afterwards where Amanda Lemos uh, did not get a performance bonus after one shot knocking out. I, sh- I shouldn't say one shot. It really was two shots. Uh, Montserrat Ruiz, she threw. They, you know, they're kind of feeling out, trying to find range. Ruiz went to close the distance like she wants to do, dropped her hand a little bit as she did, and, all, and she ate. The shortest, tightest cross right down the middle that landed precision. Stumbled her, almost spun her with that shot, and then finished her off with a perfectly timed left hook. And as she fell down, she fin- she landed a big uh, hammer fist. That was the best, like, flying, like, standing to ground strike I've seen since Dan Henderson, like, put one on Michael Bisping. Yeah. Like, just <laughs> the arc. Yeah, three strikes. That's she was out, you know, as they say in baseball. Um, what did you think of the stoppage? Were you good uh, with the stoppage? It was one of the yeah, I'm okay with it because the way her body fell, you know, the way the hammer fist was like wasn't blocked at all, coming straight down. And then and obviously this is hindsight's a little twenty twenty, the referee didn't have this advantage, but when he jumps in, and I don't remember who the referee was, was it Chris Tagnoni. Oh, our buddy Chris Tagnoni. Of course it was. Uh, when Chris Tagnoni went to stop, he he, uh, Arlo's saying that missed. I, I don't think it missed. I think it, I thought it landed. The hammer fist. He's saying it missed. But when and I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure it landed. Ruiz got up. She was like stumbling back, 
And then the, you know, the fight stops. The referee's waving it off in front of her. And she's putting her hands up like she's ready to fight. Like she doesn't even know where her opponent is. Like she's still thinking the fight's going on. <laughs> um, yeah. I thought she was her. I mean, the way they were calling for it to get her a stool to sit down, uh, it, it was she was hurt bad. See, and the the I don't have a problem with the stoppage. It looked like a shitty stoppage because of how Tonyoni did it. I mean, if you look at it, he's grabbing Lamos from behind and trying to hold her back like he's trying to break up a cafeteria fight yeah. in a high school. <laughs> when you stop a fight, you jump on the losing fighter and yeah. wave off the winning fighter because if that person can't continue, your job is to protect them. So you jump on the losing fighter, you go like this, and that way Conejo isn't getting up and stumbling all over the place. That's true. Well, that and – so I thought you were asking. I thought you were asking me like, was the stoppage good and bad in the sense like should have been on longer? Well, no, I meant both. I, I, I meant. Both. I, I didn't, I didn't yeah. think you were asking me like, is Chris Tyone just terrible at his job? Because we already established that a long time yeah. ago. Chris Tyone's always going to do something wrong, and it's weird. We we tend to. I feel like I've been criticizing referees much, and I and I know it's a terrible terrible job. It's 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 a it's a thankless job. If you have a good stoppage, no one ever gets the credit. You, if you do the right thing. No one ever gives you credit, and most of the time, referees jump in and make a stoppage at the right time. But God forbid you may do it wrong or close to being wrong, even like not even being a bad stoppage, but maybe close to being a max stoppage. Then you get crucified. Everyone talks about it. I don't know any other professions that always gets criticized for the bad and never gets criticized for all the good they do. <laughs> Anyways, we'll move on. Uh, oh no, that's not move on. Let's do, let's let's do Lamos. So the, she's had two really incredible performances, back to back. Real quick, I want, give me a name. What, what would you like to see her fight next? Uh, maybe the winner of Mackenzie Duran and Mar- Marina Rodriguez in a couple weeks. Really? Or Carlos that Barza. high, huh? Oh, I, I if that I mean the Duran Rodriguez winner might be next for a title shot once yeah. uh, um what's the name sorted out. Otherwise, maybe Carlos Barza. Especially especially if if uh, Mackenzie Duran. Uh, I wasn't going that high. Uh, I wrote down uh, Nina Ansaroff. Or I, I should sorry. I should say Nina Nunes. That's what I would do. I'd be fine with that if like if they want to take a little more cautious approach with her. But yeah, th- they definitely need to stop giving her unranked opponents. Oh yeah, no, no. She's she's proven that she's she's upper I mean, echelon of the of the division. This was a step down, but I mean, she punted Lavinia Sosa, so you can't give her anyone lower ranked than Sosa. Yeah. Is is Nunez lower than Sosa? Yeah, but I mean, that's but right now Nunez off. is coming off wins, and yeah, and that so was long layoff, you, and yeah, yeah, maybe because I'm grading it from above Ruiz, and I'm not going yeah. above Sosa. Yeah. I think uh, it needs to be above Sosa. Like, I don't think you can give her like an Angela Hill or Randa Marcos type anymore. You know, really? Like, you're just no. no I thought okay. I, I think Lamos, as much as I love Angela Hill, she's earned a fight with a a, a more accomplished fighter right now oh, than Angela Hill. Oh, Lamos. I'm saying does. above. I need yeah. to be like way above. Oh, okay, those. yeah. See, see, I look at answer as that, or sorry, I, I apologize. I'm not trying to disrespect her. Nunez. Mm-hmm. I'm just used to saying answer off. Nunez. Yeah. Uh, I look at it as the same area as Angela Hill, that area. So, So you're saying you're beyond that. I think I think Ansaroff's a little higher there, so I, I'd okay. be okay with Ansaroff. But that's kind of like the, the the floor, the lowest I would go with with Lemos, and I'd go as high, like I said, as like the the Dern Rodriguez winner. Okay. Uh, before that, uh, Khalid Taha versus Sergey Marasov. This was probably the worst fight of the card. Yep. And I'll give Marasov. He's a much better wrestler than I thought he was. Like he showed some really slick wrestling tonight. Some good good trips, good body locks. I was really impressed with his just smothering top control. And, and what most impressed me was not that he could keep Taha down, but I just saw Honey Barcelos, who I think is legit, you know, grapple with Taha and not have as much success grappling as we just saw Morosov. This is a really good good performance, in my opinion, from Morosov. I agree. And the only thing that I felt pretty comfortable about going into this fight, I mean, I, I picked Morozov. Is that even That's though Taha pick. looks like a little tank, that Morozov would actually be the more physical and stronger guy once they got and their hands was. on each other. That was pretty much the dynamic of the fight. So, and he was uh, the one thing I liked about Taha, even though in a loss, is he wasn't the guy who mentally broke like other guys. Like even the third round, he was still trying to find a finish. It wasn't <laughs> he wasn't close to getting it, but you've seen other guys finish, and other guys would have got finished. 
Um, before that, Francisco Figueredo uh, dropped a decision to Malcolm Gordon. Uh, this was the closest fight. This is the fight that had the most controversy, uh, you know, people debating who won. I scored it 29-28 for Gordon. Who did you score it for? I scored it 29-28 for Gordon as well. Okay. So we, we both think – but it, it was almost 50-50 up from what I saw. Uh, I didn't check MMA decisions, but I'm assuming it's probably close to that. Um, what I feel about this fight was simply Gordon gave himself every opportunity to win and Figueroa kept limiting his opportunities to win. I agree. I'm, I was looking to see if I could see who it was that said it on Twitter so I could give him proper credit. But they said Figueroa was fighting like he had five rounds. Oh. Well, and took, I think that was just the perfect way to put it. He took the second – he pretty much took the second round off. Like for about three or four minutes of the second round, he just moved away and dodged punches. And I'm like, why is he doing that? Like he throw back. Yep, and he I, did. And when he threw, he actually was winning. The problem is he didn't put enough in the bank that when Gordon got a takedown and landed – the little, little rabbit punches at the end of the round. He stole the round. That's he stole the, and he it. also stole the round because he was he was throwing punches when Figueroa wasn't. And if I throw eighty punches at you and you throw eight at me, you might be a better boxer than me. But I'm probably gonna land more just from the very fact that I'm throwing eighty punches. I'm throwing ten times the punches you're throwing at me. Yep. Um. So. I didn't like that he gave the uh, – first of all, he gave the second round away and then the flying knee in the third round. I understand the thinking of it. Is this the guy that's really trying to force wrestling, got a duck in his head, and if you land the flying knee, you'll knock him out and you'll get a bonus and you'll steal a bonus from Lamos and all that stuff. But it's – the the chance of landing it and getting a knockout is so slim. There's a much better chance that you miss it and you fall like he did. Uh, that was aggravated. And to me, Gordon, well, I still think Figueroa is a better fighter. Gordon had a game plan, and he his best game plan was to win a wrestling match, which I don't think he could even win the wrestling match, but just make it a wrestling match, and he did. Good for him. That's nothing Nothing else much more to say than that. I mean, he came out like a wild man, as he often does, but then, yeah, turned it into a grind. It was kind of deceptive. Figueroa, whatever the reason for the lack of urgency, as Arlo called it, whether did he think it was a five round fight or just the overcompensating in an attempt to manage his gas tank that, you know, to a certain extent, Davison is prone to as well. Just Davison is such a better fighter that he still wins the fights, even if he seems a little too deliberate sometimes. Yeah. Bass says this was a garbage decision. I don't know if he's saying it as in, like the fight was garbage or if he, if he thought Figueredo should have got the decision. I would have been okay if Figueredo got the decision just for the record. I, I mean, whoever gave all three rounds to Gordon, uh, that's a, that's a tough a, one for me to justify. Uh, see, I'm actually okay with it. Because to me, he won the third round, obviously. And the first yeah. two rounds to me were close. Like, I'm not saying, like, if I wish I, like, I always want to mention to people, like, a 30 27 does not mean it was a blowout. You know, you could have just squeaked by, you know, think about yeah. like a football game. The first two teams play, you know, a, a quarter of football and one team scores a touchdown and then scores a field goal. It was close. But that one, that team won, and then the second and the third, you, you know, you do that for three quarters. It's, it's still – all three quarters were close, but one team got seven, the other got three, or say seven to six or whatever. Um, or, you know, baseball two to one. Uh, Bass thought Figueroa won. Um, he's calling a robbery. He's calling a robbery, back. and he's saying he's never going to watch MMA again until he gets his justice. <laughs> um, until KB Buller is back in the UFC. But, Speaking of our buddy Bass, Alan Bordeaux, uh, Bass's buddy, uh, lost by second round TKO to Ajigo Nascimento. He Bordeaux looked great early. He was stuffing takedowns. He was landing, yeah, you know, he was landing the harder shots on the feet. He was defending takedowns by landing elbows. He had a great first round. Some people I saw on Twitter was actually giving it a ten eight round for Bordeaux. Until his gas tank absolutely shit the bed and Matt Cimento took him out. I'll let you break that down and I'll give you my thoughts after that. What would you think? I got nothing to break down. Alan Bodeau but looks it, like... It, get the people they want, Ben. Break the, it down. The people, the people want one-liners. Alan Bodeau looks like Corey Anderson outside of training camp. <laughs> like we're, he probably just kind of walks around at like 240 with a little bit of a gut until it's time to train for that. That's that's what he looks like walking into the cage. <laughs> he, looks like Alan, he looks like Corey Anderson two years retired. Yeah, that first that first round was just 
oh man, it was it was a it was a shit show. It's uh, it's one of those like Hunsucker Vandera type like even as the division as a whole like is about as healthy as it's ever been in the UFC like literally like the the youth movement the kind of uh new generation of fighters that are taking over the heavyweight division but we still get these fights like this ugh, this thing was ugly and i can't believe one of these dudes got a bonus but so i know you got a bonus on top of it so but no i i I'm, i think i'm saying his name right I, I my french is not that great even though i married a canadian my french is not that good uh, I married a Canadian that's from the A. Would they say A? Not 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 French Canadian. Uh, uh, thank God my wife doesn't have that accent. <laughs> shout shout out to all A. Shout out to all my <laughs> all my friends from Canada. I love y'all, you guys. But A is not a good look. But when you're from Boston area, you shouldn't be talking about accents. Um, I'll say this about Nascimento. Bordeaux gassed out, but I actually think it was what Nascimento was doing that gassed him out, and that was even though he Bordeaux was. Like fighting off takedown attempts and landing close elbows, Nascimento was still making him grapple with them. And then I think that tie, a combination of between that tying out and then Nascimento, which I did find impressive, he stopped throwing looping punches and we wasn't. He stopped trying to end the fight with one punch and he tightened everything up. And suddenly everything in the second round was coming straight down the pipe instead of, and Bo, and Bodell was still throwing one, two punches, looping kind of styles like that. And because of that one, he was tired, so his hand speed lost some time. But he was throwing looping punches, and um, Nascimento uh, was beating him to the punch. Uh, Sh- Chase Sherman call out. He called out Chase Sherman. I, I don't know. Mention that. Uh, That's a very modest call out right there. That's a man who knows his place in the division. Yeah. <laughs> like like when when you just survived a fight where you pulled Alan Bodo into full mount on you. Yeah, like oh, yeah, I you get to about, call out Chase Sherman. I forgot about. I'm telling that you, part. dude, the first round was a complete shit show. Yeah, I I, I forgot about that part. Um, I think it'd be funny if we had a fighter who just always called out like ridiculously bad callouts. Just like like most people's callouts are pretty good, but if you had like guy wins his debut and he's like, I want St. Pierre, get St. Pierre out of retirement, you know, like what? <laughs> you just won the prelim fight, you know, or just keeps calling out. I'll call out like a guy who's not even in his weight class, like a like a middleweight calling out John Jones. Like I want John Jones, you know. Um, I think I think Bass had the line of the night saying that my wife is <laughs> Tanner Bosa Canadian, not see fear Canadian. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, my wife doesn't have a mullet. Uh, she has many family members who do. <laughs> uh, she does have all her teeth. Thankfully, so all of uh, actually not all no all of her immediate family has their teeth. But uh, when you get up in that, that part of Canada and your cousin's names are uh, Butchie and Cletus and, and uh, Cletus? No, they don't have a, they don't have, she doesn't have she has a lot of cousins. I'm trying to think of some there was some Garthy and and yeah there's there's a couple of teeth missing. Uh, wow. They enjoy their tractor pulls and uh, shout out to all my family members in Canada who <laughs> suddenly our suddenly our viewership and. New Brunswick, Canada just plummeted. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, there was a comment about Nascimento. Arlo asks, how big or small prospect is Nascimento? So hard to figure out. I see. I'm, I don't think he's that high of a prospect at all. Like, And because his best weapon, aside from being you know a fairly nimble guy on his feet for a guy who pushes the uh, heavyweight limit. He, he was is, down 10 pounds, though. In fantasy, he was down 10 pounds for this fight. Yeah. But honestly, on, all joking aside, that could have been the difference. Like a little better could shape. easily have been. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, interrupt you. No, I mean, that's sort of what he has. And then he's a decent wrestler and grappler. But then he goes and, again, shoots a double leg takedown and somehow ends up on his back having pulled Alan Badeau in the mount. Like, what what happens to that guy against even a fringe dude like a Chris Dawkins or a Tom oh. Aspinall? He gets his face punched into the canvas. Was he? No. Oh. On the ground, who, you know. Who was his? Wait, wait. Who was his last fight? Who beat him his last time? Oh, it was Aspinall. Aspinall, yeah. Or no, 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 no. There's Dawkins. Aspinall, Aspinall killed Bodo. Oh, wasn't it Dawkins who killed him? Maybe that's why I'm picturing that. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, but Dawkins killed him on the feet. Yeah. Yeah. So we've that's, already seen what Chris Dawkins would do. That is pulling guard, and, and it's Curtis Blades. Speaking that's of, suicide. Speaking of suicide, did you guys see that Curtis Blades is fighting? 
Drazina Rosenstrike. I think we talked about that. We like don't ever if you had a man. I think we said this. If you had a man of Drazina Rosenstrike, don't ever get matched up against Curtis Blades. And then it happened. I'm like what? That's Anyways. yikes. Um, so you go. Let's get to the uh, let's get to the fun stuff. The Bulls, the Bears, uh, the Cutlass. Uh, want well, let's want to do the Cutlass first? Actually, no. Let's do the let's do the Bulls. Okay. Uh, I'll let you go first. So let me okay. explain it real quick. Sorry, let me explain it real quick. The Bulls and the Bears, if anybody who's not listening uh, has never heard of the Bulls and Bears, is a stock market reference. So this is, you know, your usual whose stock rose, whose stock went down. Bull is a term in the stock market when something's going good, it's a bull stock, or when it's, things going bad, it's a bear stock. So we you want to be on the bull stock. So we're doing the Bulls one first. We can do it. We do it hockey style. You can pick up to three stars, three being the lowest, one being the biggest star, biggest bull, whose stock rose the most. Ben, go ahead, my man. Okay. Uh, number three, uh, American top team. If Moises had pulled off the upset, they would have been number one. But, you know, he walked in there, you know, Makachev was a minus 850 favorite or something. Yep. He, he put out a valiant effort. And, and the know. night before in Bellator, they went 3-0 and in Bellator. They had – Two knockouts under two minutes. Um, Cody Law, um, oh the heavyweight, the heavyweight who knocked out. Uh, oh my god, this happened. I was there last night. Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Marks, who's the heavyweight that knocked out Ronnie Marks? He's American top team. I can't remember. His, I can't. Rem- it, it doesn't matter. He, yeah. Anyway, and uh, uh, and uh, the other one was Johnny Evelyn, who put on a ridiculous good performance. So I mean, Evelyn, it was expected, but uh, and so was Cody Law. But get yeah. carry on. Sorry, good weekend and, for American Top Team. Yeah, and who was who was down there for America? That was um, it was Mike Brown. It was and he, uh, they, no, Mike Brown was up at Bellator. It was Mike Brown. Yeah, Mike King, Brown was it was at Bellator because it was uh King Mo. Bahumpa that was and yeah King Mo because you know tonight it was you know Bahumpa basically congratulating guys in the octagon every other fight. Uh, it's a good night Steve for them. Mako, Steve Mako was down there, the wrestling coach. Dude. Steve Mako was the ultimate. I believe you when you say nobody wants to fight you. Yeah. <laughs> like I believe I like Steve Mako's career was just kind of n- never got off the ground because nobody wanted to fight the guy. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so number three, American Top Team, real good n- night for those guys. Uh, number two, gonna give it to uh, Billy Quarantillo. Like I expected him to lose this fight. Not only did he win, but just answered a lot of the questions. Uh, reversed a lot of the narratives that made me not pick him. Like, that's a real tough division to ascend in, but he's off to a good start. Gabriel Benitez is a super dangerous guy, and he just completely nullified him. Uh, there are a lot of people that could have number one. Like, basically yeah. every single main card winner, yeah, aside from maybe Makachev, did more than expected of them. I agree. But I will give it to Misha Tate. Like, there were a lot of different ways we could be talking about Misha Tate's comeback on this show right now, mm-hmm. and almost all of them are worse than the way we're talking about it right now. Yeah. Like from this is a joke and we'll never see her again to, oh, yeah, she's back, but like she's not a top 10 fighter. Yeah. Instead, we're like, okay, is she like just a couple fights away from a title shot? Yeah. She looked absolutely sensational, and even considering the difficulty of the opposition, I still argue that it might be the most impressive single performance of her career. So those are my bulls. Yeah, I was very skeptic of Misha Tate more than anybody. She was my number one, too. Uh, I'm not going to mention it, but I thought she was a no-brainer number one based on that. Uh, I was very skeptic of her moving forward. Great performance. Uh, my number three is is submission game. The last four fights of the card all ended by submission. So uh, uh, jujitsu, somewhere the Gracies were going excited watching that card as, as jujitsu came through with four submission wins. Uh, my number two... Amanda Lemos, uh, one, uh, maybe her stock shouldn't be as high because considering she didn't get a bonus somehow, but back-to-back performance, you're talking about her facing a really, really high-ranked opponent going forward. Uh, really exciting. Uh, my number one really was my number two, but now my number one, uh, Matus Gamerot, you know, it, not beating Jeremy Stevens, it, it, you know, beating a name like that always helps, but how you beat him submitting him he hasn't been submitted since 2009 he's going to get some really good grapplers during that time and you're the one to put him out and you put him out just over a minute uh just really really good performance now let's go to the bears and these are the people that you don't want to be on this list this is people whose stock went down 
Uh, we also do it three, two, one style. Uh, I'll go number three. Guy we just talked about, Jeremy Stevens. He's had a five fight losing streak. Uh, he had a no contest mixed in there against Yaya Rodriguez, but his actual fights that had a result, he has he's 0 5. Uh, five loss in a row with Jeremy Stevens. Uh, this is the guy that I don't know if anybody thought he'd be a title challenger or a champion, but there was, might have been some people that were really excited about it. I don't know anybody who's excited about it anymore. My number two, the Figueredo brothers. Both brothers have lost their last fights. Uh, one lost the belt. One lost to Malcolm Gordon, which might be worse than losing the belt. Uh, not, not a good time for the uh, Figueredo brothers. But my number one, <clears throat> need a little backstory, though, for this one. This week, UFC uh, had a really nice story. A 66-year-old woman. I think she might be older than that. They're saying she's 66. She looks like she's about 86. But 66-year-old woman was hanging out in... A corner in Las Vegas was spotted by members of the UFC holding a sign saying Habib stop for photo. Dana White somehow got in contact with this woman who then they eventually got in contact with Habib, brought her to the arena and everything. So obviously it was a really nice story. She got to meet Habib. Really, really nice. But the reason why it's a bull, not her, but I'm throwing her family under the bus. Nellie Gonzalez's family. What the hell is a 66-year-old lady standing on the side of the road in the freaking deserts of Las Vegas? Who's when it's been like Who's 117 degrees out, yeah. Who's taking care of this with no friends and family? Like, dude, you guys dropped the ball. So uh, my bull, Nelly Gonzalez's family. <laughs> God, I didn't have many bulls, man. I had to find – I'll search for something, uh, brother. <laughs> oh. All right. So are we on – we're on yeah, bears now. Yeah, All you're, right. You're, uh, you're, you're on bears. <laughs> Number three, Gabriel Benitez. Uh, same oh, reason yeah. Quarantillo is on my uh, Bulls list. Benitez, I mean, he's lost some and he's won some, but I always, in the back of my mind, thought this is a guy who's going to turn a corner and he's going to go on a real good run, either at 145, 155, and maybe not make it into the title picture, but he'll like make it into the the lower reaches of the top 10 and like really beat some good dudes. And he just looked completely overwhelmed against Quarantillo. And most discouragingly to me, didn't do any of the things that he's good at. Like he just he looked like a deer in headlights. That's a bad look. Uh, number two, I'm going to go specifically to Francisco Figueredo. Like this was a setup fight. Yeah. Malcolm right. Gordon. Like. I like I'm glad that Malcolm Gordon's still around because he's a blast to watch. But this was. This was a this was a setup fight, and he just completely fumbled the ball, and it was a completely winnable fight for him, at least theoretically on paper. Bad look. Uh, number one, both the guys in that heavyweight opener. Get them both out of my <laughs> UFC forever. He a, like I, he got a bonus though. That's the dumbest. Like leave that check. Give that check to Amanda Lamos on the way out. Give it. Well, give it to uh, is, you is know, that, give it to Waleed. Is that the UFC give it to Waleed, Waleed, Waleed is Ismail? Is that, is that the UFC saying all Brazilians look alike? Somehow they met, they mixed up Figueiredo and Lemos. Maybe Dana just really hates Walid. He's like, no, oh, well, you know, when that guy's going to take her like twenty word interview and turn it into like a three minute rant, <laughs> like I'm not going to give him a check. I don't know. I I, I swear when when Valide translates, they say something like like I want to thank Jesus and I want to thank uh, my training partners. He just says he just translate to we're coming to get everybody. We're going to kill everybody. <laughs> He's an intense dude. I want him to go around with me everywhere and just like order my coffee for me and like, you know, get my car from like the valet when I go to a nice restaurant. I just want him to be really intense and aggressive yeah, in like I, telling I've people seen things him for in me. person once and I was too, usually, you know, I try to talk to the coaches and, you know, be chummy with everybody. Uh, yeah, he's the scary. No, he's the guy. You, no, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, yeah, you have nightmares of that guy. Um, Let's get to the cut list. Uh, these are the guys that we think should no longer be in the UFC. Uh, not totally negative. You remember, if we cut someone, that means it's openings for other people. Uh, to be on the Shillin and Duffy cut list, you have to be on both of our lists. So, Ben, I have three people. Wow. I only have two. So how about I go first, and maybe I'll be open to being convinced by your third. Okay. Uh. Number one, Dustin Stoltzfus. Oh, he, he didn't make my list. I mean, he's he's lost two, and he came into the UFC on kind of a weird Dana White's Contender Series appearance anyway. Like, you know, 
yeah. guy injured his arm during a, a takedown. Oh, I'd be yeah, fine yeah. with him going somewhere who, else for some more seasoning and coming back. Who was his first loss to? I don't remember. Kyle Dawkins. Yeah, those are uh, two back tough guys, though. That's too tough. But I didn't have him on my list. He may, he makes the cut. Uh, he, he's not. He, All right. So who's the other one? Number one, it's not going to happen, but Jeremy Stevens. That was the big surprise when I had on my list. You too. We were both saying the guy's got five losses in a row. His overall UFC record is 15 and 18. He now has the most losses in UFC history. All right, dude, you heard it here first. If he is not cut on Monday, they're keeping him around, and he'll be Conor McGregor's next opponent. Yeah. Uh, I still think it's going to be uh, Nate Diaz. Or it's, you know what, though? Knowing Conor, he wouldn't take a fight like that. He'd want Dustin Poirier again or something. But Jeremy Stevens, yeah, I can't believe he both. So the other two I had, I can't believe you didn't have it. Alan Badeau, 0 oh, 2, two stoppage losses in the UFC. Uh, and then my other one, uh, Klee Taha, he's 1 3 and 1 in the UFC, back to back losses in the UFC. I, w- I was cutting Klee Taha. But. Bodo can go. The I only, mean, so the only person that made the cut is probably one of the biggest names on the card, Jeremy Stevenson. Uh, Steven, Steven. Why am I saying Stevenson? Jeremy Stevens. I mean, I just saw, I saw good. You know, good things out of Bodo. I figure, you know, you, you put Bodo in there against, uh, you know, a Francis Ngannou type, and Francis, like, pulls him in the, into mount because that's clearly, like, Bodo's offense is just waiting for his opponent to pull him into mount. And, hey, you got you got yourself a new heavyweight champ. I think I think, <laughs> I think you put it on, on um, like, a pay-per-view, but just, like, a, you, you make, like, a fight night, and you put a pay-per-view of Alan Bodo versus KB Bueller, so Bass can order it, just Bass. He'll pay the money to see it. Um, last thing, what's your, what was your grade for the card? C. Yeah, that's the exact grade I gave. Like nothing spectacular. The main event was okay. Um, not a lot of, not too many storylines. Um, so there you guys have it. We've covered all ten fights. We thank everyone who's you know kept the chat going. We had it going through the whole show. Um, this actually is shorter. We're, we're just over an hour and a half, so that's actually short for us. Um, we do this after every UFC. We'll be back next week. We have um, TJ Dillashaw's return versus Corey Sanhagen, plus the rest of the card. We recap it all that. Uh, he's Ben. I'm Keith. Guys, make sure you, you like. That helps us get this out more, get the chat going more, share, do all this stuff. Me and Ben, we don't beg like other shows do, but it actually is important. So like, subscribe, share, tell your friends. Do all that good stuff. Help us out. Uh, We'll see you guys next time.